Good morning uh, and welcome to the program. We are in the studio of African Media Association, Malta. And uh, today we received two representatives for IOM, the International Office of Migration. Uh, it's the world's leading intake governmental organization in the field of migration. It is a body that works with government and migrants across the globe to, pro to promote uh, safe and human movement of, of people by providing services and advice. And uh, we are last today on Facebook. Uh, later, we will be, you will have the opportunity to uh, watch the same video on our YouTube channel and as, as well later on our podcast, our radio, which is called African Accent, on the SoundCloud. So from the office of Malta, we have Mrs. Laura Matuskalte. Hello, good morning. And thank you for, for coming here today. Thank you very much for having us here. Yes, thank you're you. welcome. You, you are the project manager of uh, the Assisted Voluntary Return and Reintegration uh, uh, in the office of uh, Malta. Yes. And today with you is uh, Mr. Giovanni Preston. Good morning. Good morning and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You are the operations assistant at IOM Malta. Correct, yes. Yes, uh, thanks again for accepting our invitation. And uh, of course, you are here today to tell us more about a particular service that uh, IOM offers to eligible migrants. But I'm also conscious of the fact that uh, uh, the, the brief introduction I did about your organization is not enough to enlighten our audience, as there is always someone who uh, has never heard about uh, even the most famous thing. Sure. So IOM, the International Organization for Migration, was established in 1951, and it is the leading intergovernmental organization in the field of migration, as you rightly mentioned, Regine. Um, it it works to make sure that humane and orderly migration benefits both migrants and societies, be they in countries of origin, in countries of transit, or in countries of destination. And to this end, we act in very close partnership with different partners in the places where we work. It is a global organization. We have over 450 offices around the world, and we work to advance understanding of migration issues to assist in uh, meeting the growing operational challenges of migration to uh, uphold the human dignity and well-being of migrants, to encourage social and economic dialogue through migration. So it's a very broad range of activities that, could ra that ranges from anything, from anything like labor migration to assisted voluntary return and reintegration to other migrant assistance and protection activities, including, for instance, counter-trafficking, as well as, for instance, assistance with crisis responses. So it's, it's a very broad range of operations. Since 2016, IOM is a related agency of the United Nations. And uh, as I said, we closely work in, in partnership with the governments, and we do assist migrants in need. In Malta, we have another uh, quite a wide range of activities as well and uh, we do assisted voluntary return and reintegration we've been implementing this prog this program on a continuous basis since 2009 yes. in partnership with the ministry for home affairs and national security mm -hmm. and currently uh, we're implementing the project restart six which is uh, funded under the asylum migration and integration fund amep and it's a three-year project that's currently ongoing. Prior to that, we had five other phases of the same project. Same project exactly, so restart, restart two, three, four, and five. So you're on the sixth now, as I, I saw on the exactly. website. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And in fact, I wanted, before you, you develop mm -hmm. it a little mm -hmm. bit more, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Preston, exactly, you are the operations assistant. What is the role of operation assistant? Because what I understood is that yeah. you're actually the one who is welcoming migrants who might uh, need your service. Yes, exactly. So I deal more directly with migrants, I guess, than, than uh, Laura. Uh, but I, I work mainly on the assisted voluntary return project, but what also on other projects. Yeah, sure. Uh, exactly. So um, the project is designed to provide support to everyone who wants to go back to his or her country of origin. 
uh, when I say everyone, obviously I mean third country national. Um, um, third country nationals. So uh, the key feature of this program is the voluntariness of it all. So we only support people and help people who uh, have a genuine belief, uh, sorry, a genuine will to go back to their country of origin. So it has nothing to do with forced deportation or forced return or anything like that. Um, as part of this voluntary uh, process, obviously, we can provide information to the, uh, to the persons to make sure that the, the, it's an informed decision for them to go back. So the voluntariness has to also come from uh, having the right information about the country of origin so that they know uh, that it's, for example, safe for them to go back. So um, the project is, um, there are three main phases. So there is a pre-departure phase when we provide general information about the country of origin, as I said, uh, and then more detailed and uh, tailored information about the situation of the particular person. So for example, there are certain countries where we cannot uh, to return. Uh, for example, in Somalia, we can only do in certain particular areas, for example, the capital Mogadishu, but other regional areas are more dangerous, so for safety reasons, we cannot do it. Um, then we assess the situation of the person, so for example, uh, if the person has particular medical needs or any other sort of special vulnerability, we can then address that uh, and make sure that um, the, the particular situation of vulnerability is addressed also after uh, return. Um, and then uh, we can make arrangements to prepare uh, for the decent transportation, so to obtain the travel documents. Uh, we normally liaise with the diplomatic uh, entities here, um, but also to obtain the clearance from the Maltese government, so to make sure that everything is in, uh, you know, everything is legal and it's ready for yes, the person. I, to I really leave. want to insist on that because um, your explanation is very clear, but a little bit maybe technical or I don't know, maybe a little bit not difficult to understand. But let's say. What is the reason that, what triggers the decision of migrant to go back to his country? And in, at the moment when he decided I'm going back, how, what do you do? Let's say I'm from Ghana and I want to go back to Ghana. Where do I start? How do I do? Where do I go? Sure. Okay, so in terms of the reason, it's difficult to generalize because there are very many different reasons. But in my experience, you can be, I can give you some examples. Yeah. So, for example, a, a person might want to go back because his family or her family is, is uh, back in the country of origin. So, after a long time being abroad, you know, they want to go back and, and stay with the family. Or, uh, for example, because they don't see them long term in Malta for whatever reasons, because they, they haven't integrated, you know, um, properly or because uh, it, they don't feel comfortable here or because simply because they, they, they see that they have other projects for their lives. Uh, it might also be because of their legal status here. Um, so sometimes uh, it's difficult to obtain a uh, permanent status. And so that sort of situation of instability may trigger the decision to go back. So th there are very many different reasons for, for, for which a person might want to go back. Um, in terms of the... Um, uh, the technical the departure, yes, I come to you and yeah. I want to go back to Ghana. So well, you can come directly to our office, yes. which is in Floriana, uh, in Antonio Ardu Street. Yes. Uh, oh, Otherwise, you can also call our number, which is at 212-310-11. Um, we also organize information sessions every, every month. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we normally post it on our Facebook page and our website. So if someone wants to come to the information session, they can come. Uh, we also do awareness raising lunch to sort of disseminate information. So um, that's another way uh, people can get information. But the best way if someone is an individual and wants to go back is to come to our office or give us a call and then we can organize an individual appointment. Okay. In that particular uh, meeting, I normally discuss the options. Um, as I said, the legal status of the person here is not relevant uh, necessarily okay, because... Uh, so anyone can benefit from that because uh, yeah. I read on the website that fair asylum seeker, for example, cannot benefit from your service? No, they can. Correct? It's they not can? correct. No, so no that's... Uh, that's something that we need to clarify. So anyone can benefit, as Giovanna was saying, uh, as long as the person is a third country national, meaning a national of non-EU member state, exactly. and then as long as they are in need of support to go back to their home country, so if they're willing but unable to, to organize it themselves. Exactly. And in most cases, it would indeed be the case because people would need assistance with travel documents, would need assistance with flight tickets, with all the other arrangements. Plus, there is the reintegration package that is aimed at helping them, once they go back to their country of origin, to restart their lives there, to facilitate, to make it easier for them. 
So anyone can benefit as long as they're a third country national. It can be people who would have overstayed their visas. It could be people whose asylum application has been rejected, regardless of whether it's the first or the second rejection. It could also be a person who has protection in Malta, be it refugee status, be it subsidiary protection, and they decide to renounce it and to go back to their country. It could be someone who entered in an irregular way and just decide to go back. So the, the, the range is broad of the, of the target group whom we can assist as long as the forced return process has not been initiated by the relevant authorities. Okay. So if someone has started, his, uh, the decision has been taken that he will be deported, you cannot benefit from your But in any from case, we can provide them with counseling. Yeah. We always ask for clearance from the Ministry for Home Affairs and National Security, which is our project partner, on a case-by-case -case basis for each individual case so that we make sure that the government is aware of who is returning, and then each case is assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. So we would be able to then advise the person individually, as Giovanni said, during the counseling session that we can hold either in our offices or where it's convenient for the person. In addition to the information dissemination outreach activities that, that he was referring to, I wish also to add that we have a contact hour at HTV, one of the open centers. Yes which is every Monday in the morning, so that people who are interested as well, they can come and get the information. This is more relevant to those who and are And what is that information? What, what do you propose, what do you give to the people who decide to go back mm -hmm. in terms of economical reintegration in the country of origin? So the information that we provide, we're in a very good position in the sense that, as I mentioned, we have over 450 offices around the world. So most probably wherever the person wants to go back to, we have our colleagues there, our office there, who are available to support. So for instance, for people who would have spent long periods of time abroad, we're always ready to approach our offices to ask for more up-to-date information about the country so we can advise them. We also give them information about their situation here, their opportunities in the country of origin, what assistance will be provided to them within the framework of the program. We guide them step by step through the process, keeping updated as we move along. So for instance, when the clearance arrives, when the travel document arrives, we coordinate for the flight tickets, you know, when it's convenient for them to go. We had cases where a person, for instance, would have a medical appointment that he or she does not want to miss, so we would arrange the flight tickets accordingly. Mm -hmm. Then we would inform them that, you know, in transit, we'll have our colleagues who will be providing transit assistance upon arrival. They will receive arrival assistance, and we also provide them information about their reintegration grant, because the reintegration grant, it's 4,000 euro, 200 euro is given in cash pre-departure at the airport, yes. and then 3,800 is given in the country of origin, but that is not provided in cash, that is given in kind, yes. meaning by way of payments to vendors or service providers of the goods or services that the person needs to, to start his reintegration activity. Yes. So. All this is part of counseling, so we guide the, the person who approaches us through the process. So I, I want to explain it a little bit more simply because the fact that I'm origin from Africa and then I kind of sometimes understand a little bit more the, the issues that the African rights, because from your website, from your project, you say that uh, the returnee have to bring three quotations from three different service providers. Who helps the retinue to gather all this? Is it a, a process that he, do, he does himself or is there anybody there who is so, helping? Yeah, so person? we have offices in the main country of origin, so many African countries. You mentioned Ghana before, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for example. We have an office in Accra. Yes. Um, and our colleagues there can help the person to actually get all the documents uh, right and ready. Um, and, and also like uh, guiding the individual plan for the, for example, a startup business that, that this person might want to uh, start up in, in a country of origin. So we have um, uh, our colleagues there who can help. So a person then, wants to start a business, let's say he wants to drive a car, he has to bring you three different prices? Exactly. So if he wants to buy, for example, a, a car, he has to go to three different vendors. Yes. 
and then uh, provide a written quotations that we ha which has to be comparable uh, with the other two, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, send it to our office uh, in, uh, in the country of origin, which then send it to us, and then we can verify it, uh, and then we choose the more appropriate one. So and you do so to help the person to, because what is the reason why you, you, you ask for three quotations? Because I don't understand. Okay, yes. so <laughs> the reason why it's not given in cash, yes. but it's provided in kind mm -hmm. is that throughout the years, IOM has been implementing assisted voluntary return and reintegration pro projects globally since 1979. First in some European countries, then the programs uh, became the program scope became global. And it was learned over the years that in kind assistance contributes better to sustainability, meaning that people do not spend the money on their immediate needs on maybe repaying some debts yes. or you know paying off weddings or funerals heaven forbid or spending it on on something that will not give them income in the longer yes. run so the idea is to support them to reestablish to restart their lives there with the support is limited but it helps for the better start yes. okay so why we're asking for three quotations is just to ensure that we're selecting the best vendor because if the returnee has this money available for his disposal maybe one vendor will be the most expensive one right no <laughs> so question. we just want to make sure that i mean it's also part of the procurement regulations both eu wide and within iom but to make it uh, to put it simply we just need to ensure that the best option is chosen and then yes. if there is some money left available it can be spent on some other goods or items that could also help support the, the business. In most cases people choose the small business option. Yes. Although it's important to emphasize that the reintegration assistance can also be spent if need be on medical needs, for instance covering medications, treatment, in some cases, people would choose to spend part of it on the medical needs and then the rest to still invest to be able to sustain themselves So in you can the decide to, to follow two paths with that money you say? It yes, is business yes. It's it can also be used, for instance, for education if the person wants to continue with his or her education. So it's really tailor-made. There is no solution that you know, fits every returnee. It depends on their needs, it depends on their situation, on their skills mm -hmm. that they would have acquired in the country of origin while they're traveling in Malta. So that's why we do this individual counseling both prior to departure and then upon return in the country of origin because our colleagues are effectively the experts there in the field who also know what might work and what might not work I because see. if a business is likely to succeed in some part or in one part of Ghana it might not be feasible in a certain region of Nigeria yes. or Niger or another country so it's really tailor-made to the individual situation and to the needs of the person there is another. Mm, thank you for the information provided, uh, Optimina. But there is also it's not a problem. It is something that is part of your, the service that you offer. You said that there is no accommodation, special accommodation for returnees. So if someone has been living in Europe for many years, he doesn't have any more family back where he wants to go back. How where do, do, does he start if you don't provide accommodation? Or, Part of the reintegration grant can be used to cover accommodation expenses, and we had uh, cases. Uh, uh, we had cases of returnees who used part of the money to cover the accommodation. What would not be, what would not be accepted within the, the remit of the project is if the entire amount is just spent on accommodation rather than investment, because and then the returnee might not be able to further support himself once that money once that money finishes and then you know so rather than for instance furnishing a house what we would encourage the returnees to do 
is to start their own activity, be it a small business or to continue with some education, vocational training, perhaps ask for IOM's assistance in the country of origin to look for employment if that's something they want to do. Okay. So to have their reintegration plan and then that income that will be generated from this reintegration project will eventually support them, you know, also with accommodation in the future because they will be able to, to use the money that they, that they gain from the, from, the business that from the business to use it for accommodation. But if it's an immediate need and there's a need to rent an accommodation for, for a limited period yes. of time, yes, it could be supported as part of the reintegration grant. I, uh, I assisted myself on uh, one of your information sessions at your office uh, in Floriana and uh, you believe it or not, I started actually uh, promoting your project uh, in the uh, migrant community. I was really one of your strong promoters and then... Uh, I'm very happy to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> you welcome. You. Because, uh, as you know, we're working on a project with uh, some migrants and we face many difficult issues from uh, people coming here, so it was one of the solutions that we were uh, promoting. And one of the issues that was raised by many migrants was that um, some who have been working in the country for many years that uh, save their money in the social security uh, of the country, when going back, they don't receive back that money. So that is a limitation for them. How do you go about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that we discussed recently, actually. We had a, a meeting with uh, migrant communities and, and many other communities um, mentioned this problem. So it's certainly a problem that is, it's, uh, we realize that it's a problem uh, for, for many migrants. It's not directly included in our program, so we, we don't have anything specific in relation to this. Uh, but it's definitely some, something that we can look up in the future. Perhaps we can support you know, uh, migrant communities who want to raise this with the government. Yes. Ultimately, it's up to the government to decide this, right? It's not, it it's not up to us. You, That's the thing. So, but it's definitely something that we can, you know, perhaps advocate in the future and, or help migrants to raise their voices. Yes. But mm. I would suggest that individual migrants address it to their communities, to their leaders, and then so when they are aware of such cases, they can present concrete examples and take it further with relevant authorities, as Giovanni was saying. From IOM side, we, we stand ready to support with, with lobby, with whatever is needed from our side. That's good. We, we asked our uh, viewers to post any question that uh, might come during the interview. And uh, we just received one question. How, uh, after the return date, does IOM follow the returnee? Uh, can you give some figures of uh, volunteer, vol volunteer returns in the, in the past years? Can you give some figures? Of yes. That? So since the beginning of the continuous ABR program, because we had the first operation still back in 2007, but the continuous program, so the restart project, mm -hmm. uh, started in 2009. Since then, we've assisted over 320 people to go back to different countries of origin, mm -hmm. uh, mostly Sub-Saharan Africa. So the main countries of origin would be Ghana, Nigeria, Mali, but also other countries such as India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, we had uh, returnees returning to Iran. So it's a really wide, uh, wide range of countries where we have assisted people to go back. Once the returnee goes back, as we were saying, so first is the counseling pre-departure and then all the travel assistance. Yes. And then once they arrive in the country of origin, they're met by our colleagues upon arrival. Yes. They can agree, uh, they will also be given contact details of the IOM office in the country of origin. They can agree immediately on the counseling session with the receiving mission. Mm -hmm. And so from there, they take their reintegration plan further. Before they depart, we discuss already with them the ideas yes. that they could have in terms of their reintegration. Mm -hmm. We communicate this to the country office okay. in, in the country of origin, where so, so as to make colleagues aware of what people might wish to do. And uh, they receive the counseling upon return and they continue with their reintegration process already in the country of origin. So it's IOM offices there yes. that do support them after okay. return. In fact, the question was because I, I couldn't read how long after the return that does IOM follows the returnee? So it will depend on, on what? 
It depends how, how fast the reintegration plan is implemented. A lot of it also depends on the returnee, how proactive he or she is in contacting the office and getting the right documentation so as to proceed with the necessary payments. Um, and once the reintegration plan is implemented, so the mission would be following up up until the reintegration plan is, is completed, is implemented, provided, of course, that the returnee is reachable, is available to, to be involved in this process. And then once the plan is completed, the mission would also carry out reintegration monitoring, which can be done three to six months, sometimes one year after the return. Again, based on the consent of the returnee uh, to visit the site of his business, to check how it's, how it's going, if there are any challenges that the person needs more support with, also to get feedback on what worked, what did not work, maybe suggestions on how it could be improved, in particular in certain parts of, of the countries of origin, you know, maybe there are some challenges that we need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. So it helps us in turn to further improve our program because we do take this feedback and we report it not only to our project partner or the donor, but also we take it as IOM to further improve our program. So but this project, it is the, the sixth one. That means that the project has a duration. Now this sixth one, is it the last one or until when? Is We're, it hoping <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping not. We're hoping not. Because there's definitely the need to continue providing yes. this assistance mm -hmm. to people who, who wish to, to benefit from it. Yes. Uh, this project started in July 2016 mm -hmm. and it's running until end of June 2019. Mm -hmm. But then we're hoping that we will be able to continue with the activities so there, thereafter. There is still this time for anyone who wants to apply to, to come and Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And do you have, a, since we are live on the social media, do you have a social media Facebook page for the project? Yes, we do. Yes. So the, uh, it's uh, uh, Facebook IOM Malta. Facebook. So if you digital IOM Malta, you should be able to find it. Fine. And we have a website as well. Okay which is, uh, I don't know the exact, but it's uh, www.iommalta.org.nt, yes, I think. Um, but so uh, even Google, if you put IOM Malta, you'll find it easily. Um, yes, and uh, we are also active on Twitter, um, and I think this is about it. So. Uh, it is uh, true that IOM is a very famous organization, and I guess that anyone who really wants to know about it can just go on, the, as you say, on the internet and... Uh, and, uh, I, uh, I and saw there, yes, sorry, sorry if I made it in, there you would also find information on our other programs that I, I started uh, describing a bit. It's not only assisted voluntary return that yes. we do, you can also find information on resettlement from Malta and to Malta, relocation, uh, counter-trafficking, integration, yes. all the activities that we work on, also for instance migration and health. Uh, addressing sexual and gender-based violence. So it's not only return that we're focusing on. I understand it's the topic of our conversation yes. this morning, but on our website you can also find all that other information. But when you talk about resettlement, what do you mean by that? Because the most famous resettlement was the one who stopped to, to America. Yes. Do you also okay. have another resettlement program apart from exactly. that? Exactly. Resettlement to the United States was a non, is still an ongoing program because we'll, we're still processing the cases that, that we have in, in progress. And uh, since 2008, we've assisted over 3,200 people with resettlement from Malta to the United States. We also had ad hoc resettlement of... Uh, migrants to Canada, to Australia, on the basis of bilateral agreements with these countries. Mm -hmm. Now Malta is becoming also a receiving country for resettlement. So back in 2017, mm -hmm. we were supporting the government with the resettling of a number of Syrian nationals from Turkey to Malta. The same goes for relocation if between the years, say 2009, 2013, mm -hmm. We assisted roughly 600 people to be relocated from Malta to other European countries, either within the framework of European projects, URIMA, 
or on a bilateral basis, bilateral agreements with the receiving countries. Uh, lately, 2016-2017, Malta received 168 migrants from Italy and Greece. That's a combined number mm -hmm. meeting its uh, relocation okay. quota. So we support the government with, with these initiatives as well. I can also add to like in the this year we had some uh, boat, new boat arrivals right. and so we were actually involved with the relocation of uh, many of the migrants uh, from Malta to other uh, European countries. Uh, we worked for example in the Netherlands uh, with the, uh, the Irish government, mm -hmm. uh, Portugal, so many different governments. So we were involved with that as well this year. Okay. But at in the moment, as you, as you mentioned before, the, the main one, which is US RAP, we're finishing the applications that we are, that are already open, but okay. unfortunately it's, gonna, it's closed. Well, so we don't have any new applications. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question that's coming from the, uh, our viewers. Is it possible for an Italian refugee to be resettled in Malta? Someone who has a, a, the protection in Italy and who wants to go away probably because there is no job in Italy, will he be resettled in Malta? That's the question. It's a good question. It's more, <laughs> it's more of, a, of a legal, uh, legal question. Uh, it's technically, so, uh, Obviously, if you receive protection in a particular country, yes. you're not, uh, you, you can travel because you have a passport that allows you to travel. Mm -hmm. But technically, you receive protection in one country, so you're not supposed to go to another country to work unless you receive a permit for that particular country, which in this case will be Malta. So that's that's the short answer. Is it possible to receive permit from from Malta? In that well, case? You could you could apply, but it's something that you obviously would have to deal with the uh, local authorities. Okay. Um, perhaps it's more something that um, you know a, a lawyer can help with. Uh, it's not something that we deal directly. Uh, yeah. But we, we do have uh, many. Uh, we, we encountered many actually, uh, not many. I would say, but some few instances of uh, refugees that moved to Malta and then asked for our assistance. So. Um, you it's also have great. offices in Italy, so if let's yes, say a refugee exactly. wants to benefit from the service that you, you're talking about here, they can visit your office in Italy. Exactly, we do have our, in fact our coordinating office for the Mediterranean is based in Rome, okay. and we do have presence uh, also in landing points in Italy, so IOM is present there and uh, people who are in Italy and have similar questions, they could also be, be advised to approach our colleagues there okay. for, for guidance. We are almost about to close the interview because the, if you don't have more questions and uh, if uh, we, I think we've spoken about more, more or less the, the entire program, we know that, uh, I'm going to summarize a little bit, it is 4,000 euros that we propose for the voluntary return. That is the uh, money that will be used there to start uh, a new life practically for someone who decides to go back. Exactly. So as we said, it's assistance with obtaining a clearance, it's assistance with obtaining a travel document for which we cooperate with the embassies yes. of relevant countries of origin, it's assistance with any special needs in cases of vulnerable people, be they medical cases, unaccompanied minors, other, other vulnerable individuals uh, that, that have special needs. We take those into consideration and we address those throughout the process. Organizing the departure purchase of flight tickets, transit assistance, arrival assistance, reintegration grant, as you rightly mentioned, 200 euro pre-departure, and then 3,800 in the country of origin, upon proof of investment, yes. as we spoke, yes. and then monitoring if the returnee consents to getting in touch with IOM. Uh, that, is very, that is very good. So uh, your office in Floriana, and you hold a uh, regular information session about this project? Yes, roughly once a month. Um, and then we also have other activities. So, for example, we organize focus groups with uh, um, people, like stakeholders, who work directly with migrants to make sure that they are informed about our program. Okay. Uh, we also do awareness lunches. For example, we have this Friday we have one uh, in Marsa. Um, at a it's a Somali restaurant in Marsa. Um, when we, it's, it's a good way to uh, directly, you know, have a chat, informal chat with migrants who might be interested in going back. Um, Okay, I would have to thank you for coming here today, uh, Mrs. Matuskalti and Mr. Prestan. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you also, uh, you watching us live on Facebook. Uh, if you have a further question after the, we, the, we close the program, you can still put uh, your comments on the, uh, our page or send us a private message. 
or you can directly uh, uh, contact our guests visiting the visiting the office in Floriana or calling the phone number that will be posted later on our page as well. This interview will also be available soon on our YouTube channel, uh, which is called African Media Association Malta, and also in our podcast on SoundCloud, African Accents. And make sure to follow us on social media, and uh, see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you.